Welcome everybody uh, to our book talk tonight, which is a, a, a very special talk on a very special day on Jane Jacobs' birthday, May 4th, which we celebrate, we try to celebrate and acknowledge every year along with people and um, urbanists across America. We have another hero of American urbanism um, as the subject of the biography by Richard Rhine, American urbanist, uh, how, Holly White, Holly, how Holly White's unconventional wisdom reshaped public life. The book that was uh, created after the series of films, and we're gonna show you just a, a brief clip of the social life of small urban spaces um, that Holly, the genius of Holly White conceived, executed, and then presented first in video and, and then in, in a book compendium. Uh, this was also enormously important uh, for, for New York City, for a generation of urbanists and the approach to how they looked at, at urban space and, and public space. Uh, and in order to, uh, let's see, I guess the, the thing about White is that he's, he seems so understated in his fame as opposed to the way that, that Jane Jacobs kind of rocketed into our consciousness and then stayed as this kind of fireworks in, in the sky. Holly White has this kind of sustaining drumbeat of influence uh, that really changed cities. It changed zoning, it changed in, in many ways. And it's not for me to say, it's for um, Richard to explain tonight. But I thought in case some of you are here, even though, Holly White hasn't affected your life the way he, is, he affected mine, uh, that we should hear his voice and see just a, a short clip of the film, uh, this film, The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces, which unfortunately is very hard to find on the internet. Um, and so we'll have a clip now, Richard will have a clip at the end. Uh, this is about a minute. Um, and um, then I'll ask Richard to come on and share a screen and give us the the, the, the background and the richness of Holly White's origins and, and urbanism. This is the plaza of the Seagram building in New York, late morning. With a time-lapse camera, we were testing a hypothesis. The sun, we were pretty sure, would be the chief factor in determining where people would sit or not sit. Now, just after 12, they begin to sit, right where the sun is. I was enormously pleased. What a perfectly splendid correlation. It was quite misleading, as we were to see later, but it was a very encouraging way to start. We were studying the Seagram Plaza because it was one of the most popular. Many people didn't think that it would be. But it was, and we wanted to find out why. Our research group, the Street Life Project, had been observing other kinds of city spaces. One was a block of 101st Street in East Harlem. Uh, we didn't know it at the time, but almost every factor that later we were to find was important for a city space, we could have found out right here. The clues were right under our noses. So um, with that clip and with the uh, cover of Richard's book here, I want to invite Richard to turn his camera on and make sure he's unmuted and he will begin to share on um, his screen. And I will mention to you that um, in the chat later, another film which is easily accessible on YouTube um, called um, what is the city but its people, which has Holly White's, White's voice and actually Holly White's script, although he is pretty unknown as its fundamental author, uh, a 1969 or seven, I think 1971 film that comes out of the plan for New York of 1969. Um, we will put that link in the chat so that you can check it out later. But this was, to me, one of the revelations of, of Richard's research and book is to connect the dots between this extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinary um, snapshot, in a way, 
of a moment in New York's history, but brought together with the eye of an incredible um, empiricist and analyst, uh, Holly White. So let me stop sharing my screen and Richard, let you take over. Um, Richard has about 45 minutes or so of talking and then we hope to invite your, your questions as well after the discussion. Thanks very much for that introduction. And uh, it's great that we were able to talk uh, on Jane Jacobs' birthday. It's her 106th. And, and um, any chance to talk about Jane Jacobs is a good, is a good opportunity. And um, especially for the biographer of William H. White, because as you'll see, they, they, uh, they work together. And I also appreciate that, that clip that you showed because um, there's that reference to East Harlem and that will pop up again a couple times in the presentation here. So um, interesting thing about William H. White is that he's one of those rare intellect public intellectuals who had a, actually had a second act and uh, what we've seen so far has, has been the second act, um, but he really was um, a man of two acts. In the first act, he wrote The Organization Man, and he studied um, the way people relate to the organizations and institutions around them. Um, the second act was his story of public spaces and urban design, and we see um, City Rediscovering the Center, the book that came out in 1988. Um, as I point out in, in the biography, there's actually a common element to, to these two pursuits. He's really looking at the world from the point of view of the individual and how she or, he or she relates to, to the world around them. Um, it's the worker in the cubicle and the organization and the institution on, on the one hand, and it's, it's people on the street um, in public spaces on the other hand. Um, and, and, and today, the only connection that people see between Jane and Holly is in that urban planning arena. But I think it's deeper than that. And, and I'm hoping that I can show you today that by getting to know White a little bit better, uh, you might appreciate Jane uh, even more than, than you do already. Um, at, at first glance, they certainly appear to be so different. Um, when they first met, probably in, in late 1957, um, at that point, White was the debonair editor. He was the best-selling author. Um, the organization man had come out in 1956. He had, he had coined the, the, the term groupthink. Uh, he worried that, that organizations were sometimes more interested in creating a harmonious uh, workplace than they were in the actual goods and services that the workplace was supposed to produce. Gee, if we just got a, if we just put together a group here that'll get along well, that's that's sort of a good day's work. Um, the hiring practices especially bothered White. He he really strenuously objected to to personality tests, um, which were just then coming into the fore for employment purposes. Um, in the organization, man, he uh, he quoted from an industry trade journal called called Personnel. It's a fairly new magazine, uh, you know, the science of, of, of human, of human uh, uh, resources, personnel management, uh, alleged science. Uh, science. Um, and, and the article says, while industry does not ignore the brilliant but erratic genius, uh, in general, it prefers its men to have normal personalities. Um, so you, you wonder what these, uh, what these men of industry would think about not a man, first of all, but a woman in the workplace. Um, some woman who maybe came to work not by taxi or subway, but who actually rode a bicycle to work from uh, a converted loft in Greenwich Village up to uh, Midtown Manhattan. You see these two guys on the street corner there, and they're, they're probably looking at this pretty, pretty odd duck going by them on some uh, weekday in, in, in Manhattan. Um, but of course, this is, this is Jane Jacobs. And um, she was a formidable force already um, at the time that Holly met her. Um, she was an experienced journalist. She wasn't so well known because she wrote for Architectural Digest, which normally did not have any bylines. Um, but, but she had had several years of experience already. And in, and in 1956, um, her editor, Douglas Haskell, highly respected um, architectural critic and editor, was invited to go to a fairly important conference at Harvard. Um, 
he couldn't make it for a variety of reasons. So he, he turned to plan B, which was another guy on his staff. And, and that guy couldn't go either. So, um, so he had to go to plan C and that would be, that would be Jane. And, and Doug Haskell knew that um, uh, there was already one woman, very few women in, in architectural circles at that time, but there was already one woman uh, who was working on that Harvard conference. So he, he couched his proposal that Jane um, show up in, in, in very cautious language. Um, another woman would not be out of uh, uh, place, might I suggest uh, Mrs. Robert Jacobs, Jane Jacobs on our masthead. So um, rest assured, he's not sending up some, uh, uh, some out of control single woman. He's sending up Bob Jacobs' wife, uh, you know, obviously gonna be a good person. Well, well, Jane showed up and uh, uh, she made a big impression. The, the, the big hot topic at the time was urban renewal, various facets of that. Um, but Jacobs got up and talked about how long established and even some, some ragtag neighborhoods offered opportunities that these new housing projects um, did not offer. And she compared an existing neighborhood in, in East Harlem. Uh, there we are, East Harlem coming up. Um, she compared that neighborhood with a, with a new housing project nearby. And East Harlem worked on many human ways. East Harlem worked and the new project did not. And, and Jane told the audience at Harvard, she, she said, you must respect strips of chaos that have a weird wisdom of their own. Well, this, this got the attention of a lot of people, especially the editors back in New York and including Holly White. And in a few months, he was putting together a series of articles for Fortune magazine that he was gonna call The Exploding Metropolis. And the, the, the Exploding Metropolis was a series of magazine articles then it quickly became a book. Um, the book and the magazine articles were noticed by the Rockefeller Foundation, um, which wanted to do some, to sponsor some writing on this new field of urban, urban study urban studies, and um, they asked Jane if she would stop her work at, at Architectural Digest and do a book. And Jane said, great, I would love to do a book, but I'm really going to need time and I'm going to need money. Um, to, uh, she had three kids at home. Her husband had a job, but her income was important to the family. I've got to have some money. Um, I need a grant. And so she turned to a few people to, to vouch for her. Um, and this is a, now in August of 1958. At, at this time, White, White's father was dying in, down in a suburb of Philadelphia. He would die within a, a month or two. Um, White himself was um, in negotiations with Henry Luce um, about his future at, at Time Incorporated. White had been passed over. He had been assistant managing editor, one of two or three. And he got passed over for the job of managing editor. He was, he, was, he was hurt by this professionally and personally, but nonetheless, he took time out to, to vouch for Jane. And he wrote a note to the Rockefeller guys and he said, um, I believe the result may prove to be one of the great contributions to the whole field of urban planning and design. And on the strength of that letter and a few others, Jane got $10,000, um, which in today's money is a huge amount of money for a uh, for a first time author. Um, back in 1958, that was worth about $85,000. So it, it was a big chunk of change. She gets working on the book, a year goes by, um, and she's just caught up and, and it's out of control. She is not gonna be able to get it done in a year. It's gonna take another year. She needs more money. So she goes first to Holly and, um, and asked him once again if he can put in a word for her with, with the Rockefellers. So White, in, in characteristic uh, Holly White style, um, says, put, calls it the glass half full. This isn't a problem, this is a great opportunity. He says, quite frankly, I was happy to hear that Jane wants to spend more time. I wholeheartedly recommend the additional assistance for the extra time she wants to give. I believe a great and influential book is in the making. And Jane got another $8,000. And of course, as we all know, the book came out uh, to uh, great critical and popular acclaim. Um, 
it meant a lot to Jane, and we know that we know that it meant a lot to her. Holly's always helped, even at the time, because on the on the edition of the book that she gave to Holly, uh, she included this inscription um, to Holly White, who had more to do with this book at a critical stage uh, than he probably realizes, but which I at least will always remember uh, with gratitude. So the question arises, and and this I did not deal with in the biography because I, I, I began to think more about it for this presentation. Why would White go to these lengths uh, to support Jane? Um, as an editor, he might have seen the value of the work, true, but it could also be, I think, that he identified with Jane much more than, than, than we all might imagine. Um, he too felt, uh, knew what it was like to be a little bit outside the social norm. Um, Despite the, the mythology about White and about Jane, um, White is viewed as this wealthy guy. Uh, he actually grew up in, in a surrounding very similar to, to what Jane grew up in. Jane was a year older than Holly. Um, Holly grew up in Westchester, outside of about 30 miles southwest of Philadelphia, um, a nice urban oriented town. When, th when this Warner movie theater opened in 1930, um, Holly would have been about 13 years old, 12 or 13. Um, and it was one of those places that a kid in Westchester could walk to. It was a walkable um, downtown environment. All the, the whole of town, I think, was uh, two miles on, on either side, sort of a square. Um, very urban oriented. Here's, a, here's another stretch of downtown Westchester. Um, it, it was... Uh, uh, not at all that much different from downtown Scranton, where Jane grew up. Her father was a medical doctor. Um, she would take the trolley from her home, which is a little further away from downtown, but into the heart of town. School was there, the library. Um, it, it was a little, a little slice of, of, urban, of the urban landscape. Um, so Holly is off, um, goes off in eighth grade to a private school. Um, and, and it's called St. Andrew's School in, in Middletown, Delaware. Um, and it was, it was a brand new school meant to compete with big elite schools in the Northeast, but it was gonna be open to all boys regardless of financial means. And we, and we don't know exactly um, what kind of uh, financial aid Holly got, if any, but he might've qualified for some. Um, Holly is in the first row of standings. He's the fourth one from the right. Um, and he's a little, well, ungainly, I guess, at this point, eighth grader, a little gawky. And uh, he said he showed up there. He, he ended up arriving about a, a month or two late. And all the social sets had been, had been created and so on. And Holly came in. He said the other kids beat him mercifully, mercilessly. Um, but eventually, of course, he, he found his way. And, uh, and socially, at least found his way. And by the time of his senior year, he's looking like a, a pretty cool and collected uh, high school senior. And he's in the, uh, the second row, the row in the back. He's standing on the right. Um, looks like a very successful guy. And, um, but there's a little subtext to that. This, he graduated number 10 in his class. But the tr trouble is this class picture is all the guys in the class. There are only 12 people in the class. And Holly's uh, marks were atrocious. Um, nonetheless, he wants to apply to Princeton. And so his headmaster um, takes a moment to, to take some special consideration with Holly's um, uh, college application and, and writes a long personal essay about Holly. Um, but but the, uh, the takeaway line is, is this, White's an unusually brilliant boy whose temperament is such that he can scarcely be classified in the ordinary way. And uh, I would guess um, that, that Jane Jacobs teachers back at Scranton, Scranton Central High School um, said something very similar about her. Um, so he's out of high school, he goes to Princeton, um, graduates in 1939, an English major, um, it's the tail end of the depression, although they didn't know that it still is the, the depression. Um, and Holly, um, if, if he's if he's wealthy, um, I don't think he would have taken a job as a Vicks Vapo Rub salesman 
working in the eastern uh, hills of Kentucky, but, but that's what he took. Um, he obviously needed a job, um, and doing that job, it's perhaps not surprising that, uh, that he would enlist in the, uh, in the Marine Corps, uh, eagerly enlist in the Marine Corps two months before Pearl Harbor. Um, so so here, here's the, the, the Marines, and when I first started on this, um, this book, I thought, well, this will be the classic story of the, the boy goes off to war, becomes the man, um, in, in Howie's case at, at Guadalcanal, where he fought, he landed with the initial drive uh, to take over that island in 1940, summer of 1942, I believe, stayed until December. Um, uh, a, a terrible battle theater, but it was a turning point of, of the war in the Pacific. And, and um, you know, I thought that would be that, how he, the boy becomes the man and he moves on to other things. But it, but it turns out that, um, the Marines are a deeper organization than, than, uh, than a lot of us believe at the first blush. And, and Holly, in the last two years of the war, taught uh, military intelligence to, uh, to younger Marines. He, he went back to Quantico. And um, in the course of doing that, of teaching that, he also wrote for the, for the Marine Corps Gazette. He wrote about six different articles, long form pieces, um, analyzing how to distill information uh, down into intelligence, um, observational techniques, patterns for objective um, uh, gathering of objective facts and, and uh, keeping uh, the subjective feelings out of it, um, differentiating people between their intentions and their capabilities, that sort of thing. Um, and, and these essays um, must have been a, uh, a pretty impressive collection that he was able to take uh, to the editors of Fortune magazine, uh, where he got hired. It was his first job in, in journalism. He had no previous journalistic experience except his in, in high school. And uh, nonetheless, he gets this plum job at, at Fortune magazine. And I'm sure it was the Marine Corps experience that, that made the difference. So he goes to work at Fortune in the uh, uh, late 1940s. He works through the 1950s. This is the era of the, of the, uh, the gray flannel suit. Um, now, Holly, um, in his book, The Organization Man, he, he makes a special mention of gray flannel suits. I mean, he himself would wear such suits all the time. Um, and he had no problem with uh, the, the surface um, orders of, of conformity. But, um, but, and he was an organization man himself, he would say. But, but what he was worried about was this quest for harmony, this, this growing reluctance of individuals to stick their own necks out of and sort of seek. Um, sort of a moral compass in the, in the larger group. Um, when, when there's a whole lot of us involved, how can any one of us be uh, guilty? Um, and that's when he termed the, the term groupthink. And, and, and what he meant by that, as it says here, the rationalized conformity, um, and which holds that these group values are not only expedient, uh, but right and good as well. It's all, almost like if we can come together with a if everybody will agree, it's probably just, it's gotta be a better decision. It's a, it's, it's a more right decision. Um, and and it, would help, it would help promote group harmony. And group harmony was, again, the, the goal that we were looking for. Um, but as Howie pointed out, it's, group harmony is not an unmixed blessing. Progress is often dependent on producing rather than mitigating um, frustrations and tensions. Um, so by the end of the 1950s, um, the exploding metropolis is out. Jane is off to the races um, with the death and life of, of great American cities. Uh, and I sure wish I had a signed copy of that book or of The Organization Man, Carol. Um, but in any case, uh, Howley found that one of his articles in, in The Exploding Metropolis also uh, caught fire. And that article was on urban sprawl, just titled simply Urban Sprawl. And this photo spread, in a way, shows the, uh, what, how the American people saw this problem. There's this bucolic farm. It happens to be in, uh, uh, outside of Westchester in the Brandywine Valley. And you see across the top, you see the row of uh, suburban type houses that are beginning to work their way uh, toward the barn and the, and the farmhouse there. 
um, people really related to this and, and uh, uh, it, it just became a very, very popular movement. He, he, he expanded the article and, and, uh, uh, and brought the subject back a year later to Life Magazine. Um, and this plant and this article got got reprinted all over the place. So, so White then um, began to be called on to, to help states, local municipalities, regions um, to, to come up with with smarter and more efficient ways to save um, the great open space. Um, you just couldn't keep the Rockefellers notwithstanding. People just did not have enough money to go out and buy all this land. Um, it, it, you had to work with the developers. Um, Holly started to, to promulgate the idea of cluster zoning where a, a guy who just bought 200 acres would set aside 150 and concentrate his housing on the other 50 or less. Um, he started thinking about um, um, farmland. He thought about farmland assessment and, and that part, that was an incentive that he realized wasn't working so well. He analyzed that shared those findings with people. And then he came up with the idea also of scenic easements. And here the idea was to go to a guy who owned a lot of land um, and, and instead of trying to buy it from him or try to get the guy to give him all his land, um, get the guy to agree to, to have a scenic easement on the land, preferably a park that would, that would later thwart um, potential developers. Um, and with the scenic easement in place, that would go with the land. Um, it wouldn't cost the, um, the organization that got it any money. Um, it wouldn't, the, the guy who gave it would, would be able to get an income tax deduction probably. And White, this was a, a, an issue at the time that people weren't sure of, but White looked into it and, and established that as a, um, as a IRS uh, rule of operation. And, um, and, and there you go. So he put all these things together and, and, he, um, and he came out with a book in 1968 Oh, sorry, this is part of his, uh, uh, his lobbying efforts uh, and, and his work. Um, there he is at the White House. Um, he's on, on the right. Lyndon Johnson is in the center, of course. Um, and, and to the left of Lyndon Johnson is Lawrence Rockefeller. And they're, um, they're presenting one report or another that, uh, uh, that they worked on in the, in the, in, in the area of, of conservation, um, open space preservation, um, uh, open, open space and recreational resources. So um, uh, that's the kind of work that White was doing in the 60s. Um, so then when his book comes out in 1968, um, and, and, and if you read it all the way through, it turns out to have all that information about uh, easements and, and, and open space preservation in there. But it also reveals another side of the uh, strategy. And that is, if you really want to preserve open space, wilderness, um, anything in between, um, the first thing you ought to do is make the city a better place to live. Give people fewer reasons to move out. Is to, and then is to look at the, at the urban landscape and see how that, how that urban landscape can be made better. So all of this kind of work, especially the part where he relates it to the urban landscape, um, uh, brought White to the attention of the New York City Planning Commission, um, which had for years been under pressure to, to, to write a master plan. The city Charter, I think of 1939, and said the city must first write a master plan. It never did. Um, Robert Moses uh, said, no need to write one. I can, I can do my own right here on the kitchen table. Um, but, but especially when John Lindsay became mayor, um, uh, people began to look at that imperative again. And also at that same time, the federal government was beginning to say, if we give you funds for various um, projects, we've got to see a master plan. We want to know where the money is going. So New York, just to keep up with its federal funding, had to do a, a master plan. So Lindsay, meanwhile, also brought in some progressive planners. Um, they instituted a lot of progressive urban practices. The things that Lindsay was doing back in the late 1960s, um, fit hand in glove with the kind of thoughts and, and, and practices that White was, was uh, advocating. So along comes the, the, uh, the master plan, plan for New York City. Um, and it's an amazing document. The, uh, the first um, uh, 
section here called Critical Issues as photographs of, of people and scenes in New York that, that uh, uh, show the, the, the harsh reality of New York as well as the, the glitter, glittering side of it. Um, um, the, um, and, but, but like a lot of other things um, from the, the late 60s, um, it, it was one of these things that, that was radical, provocative, um, in your face, unsettling, and that was not only true of the print document, but it was especially true of the film that Carol had alluded to uh, previously. What is the city but the people? And what is the city but the people opens with a video montage of just New York at its, at its worst. Um, people swearing at each other, fighting over parking places, protesters on the streets, and, and the kind of the climax is this homeless guy grabbing away, a, fighting with, over a bottle of liquor, I guess, with another homeless guy, and finally ending up smashing it over his head. Um, it, it's, um, as I say, it's, it, it's, it's provocative. Um, but I think it's, in a way, it's representative of a uh, the way a lot of institutions were at this town, at this time. There were um, the, 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 uh, the radical um, movement had, had caught fire with a lot of people. And I think even some people in the planning department um, uh, became, had that kind of radical um, air to them and, and felt they had to do something. They had to take some radical steps. And, and this film, um, I believe was their way of, of making that statement. Um, as, as Ada Louise Huxtable, the uh, architectural critic of the New York Times said, don't write off the revolution because it is being made by men in business suits. Now, um, just, just to, uh, to quickly show you where I fit in in this thing and, and uh, one, one very brief reference to myself, just to make, to make the point that, that Ada, Louise Huxtable is making here. I'm going to show you a, a photo, three people, all of whom are photographed in, 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 in literally in the year 1969. Um, and um, uh, there I am on the left, the radical firebrand editor. Um, we got Bob Goheen uh, on the right. Now, I, as the editor, ended up uh, not affecting any kind of long range permit change. Bob Goheen on the right. Um, leads Princeton to uh, co-education, also um, causes the eating clubs to lose their monopoly hold on the undergraduate social realm. And then, and then Holly in the middle, shown at his uh, 30th college reunion, uh, Holly ends up getting a lot of things done in the, uh, um, in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, one of the things that Holly discovered when he was working on the master plan was that, uh, was that developers were being given um, huge uh, floor area uh, ratio bonuses for providing public open spaces at the bottom of their buildings. And um, it was a fabulous payoff for the developers. And um, in return, the public got these spaces. And as Holly um, noticed, a lot of these spaces were um, not very good. The public was, as he said, the public was being had. Um, so he went to Don Elliott, who was the, the, the chairman of the planning commission. And he said, Don, the, you guys need to change your zoning rules. This incentive thing is not being, um, is, is not working at all. Um, and Elliott said, well, just tell me what we need to do. You gotta be very specific about it. Um, tell me what to do and maybe we'll do it. So um, White organized this group called the Street Life Project. And here he is with no training in urban design. He's not an architect, he's not a sociologist, not an anthropologist, um, but what did he have going for him? He, he had his, his Marine Corps experience. Um, and as he said later, nothing I have done demonstrates those lessons from Guadalcanal as much as the Street Life Project and studying these public open spaces. Um, in, in New York in the 1970s. Incidentally, in 1975, the Street Life Project became the uh, Project for Public Spaces, and that's still in operation today. So, so White, um, White went into battle. Um, there he is observing at the sidewalk level. He doesn't, uh, he, he doesn't want to settle for the, the uh, tele telescopic view of people on the sidewalk. He wants to see what's really going on. Um, he, uh, 
he uh, can be a little surreptitious at times. Um, this article talks about him uh, uh, catching people and, and filming them unobtrusively so as not to disrupt what the people were actually doing. But there's his camera and there's the people that, uh, that he's got. And, and his, his whole approach at this point, as much as, as Holly and Jane um, come from the same background and had a lot of the same values, um, their approach to, uh, to, the, to urban studies was, was totally different. Jane was horrified at the idea of doing questionnaires, tables, uh, charts, and so on. And, and Holly, meanwhile, uh, just reveled in it. Here's a, a chart that he did on um, the use of tables at a particular plaza. And, and men are, it's men and women color-coded by men and women. And you can see where different people are sitting throughout the day. Um, the Seagram's Plaza, which he studied endlessly, uh, because it fat, so as you saw in the first um, opening video, uh, he just didn't know, nobody knew why it, um, why it worked in particular. So he comes up with this, uh, this graph of uh, seating, the ebb and flow of seating during the course of the day. Um, then he would look at a place like um, uh, Paley Park. And he said, you know, people, um, people told me um, that they went to Paley Park for peace and quiet. And uh, could understand that, you know, get away from the city and all that. So he went in with a, uh, a decibel meter and measured the sound level because um, he knew it was right on the street. There's the street. Paley Park is in the background on the left. Um, he went in and, he, and between the sounds of the street and the sounds of the water wall, um, the um, uh, Paley Park was as noisy as a subway stop. So all of this um, gets put together in a 1980s book and film uh, called The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces. Um, and you saw the beginning clip of the film at the beginning, um, and, and um, he tries to break it down and, and try to, tries to figure out what are the elements, what, what things really make a difference in, in terms of how things work. Um, one thing was, um, as he says, this doesn't strike me as an intellectual bombshell, but people tend to sit where there are places to sit. Um, and so movable chairs was, was a critical element of that seating in many cases. And these people are grabbing a couple of chairs and the next slide, oh, they moved them now, they're gonna put them over there. The point is they get to make the choice and uh, a fixed chair, something that's fixed in place is not gonna do nearly so well. Um, if you can imagine um, you're sitting in a fixed chair and the, and the guy comes up in the chair next to you and he's smoking a cigar, um, you're probably gonna get up and leave. And here we got a guy at a fixed chair. I don't think we're gonna see anybody come up and sit right next to him um, for a while. So the elements, how he breaks them down, um, the, the elements, and they, they seem so simple. It's, you know, obviously the place to sit, some combination of sun, trees, and water. Food is good. Um, Triangulation is good, and we'll get to that in a second, and, and the street. And so you don't have to be on at um, Seagram's Plaza, you can be up at uh, in East, East Harlem. There's a nice stoop that these gentlemen are sitting on, great view of the street below. Um, water, the kids have water to play in. Uh, there's food right there. Somebody's got a little uh, outdoor concession of some, some sort. Um, down at, uh, at Seagram's Plaza, here's triangulation. We don't know if these two people in the foreground know each other or not, but they may not. And they've struck up a conversation about this third thing, that this, um, this group of street musicians that's taken up a place. Um, and they're, they're, they're chatting about them. Um, here's another couple of guys um, that are in conversation about, probably about the street musicians. Um, two strangers end up talking with each other as if they've been lifelong friends. Um, all prompted by some third thing. That's, that's triangulation. Now, the important thing, once these public spaces, these privately owned public spaces get going, and there are a lot of them, um, oh, I'm, I'm jumping the gun here. Um, a point that I should have made, yeah, it's, it's difficult to design a space that will not attract people. Um, what is remarkable is how often this has been accomplished. Um, and, and sure enough, so um, the, the, the other thing, the other part of this point is once you get one working, 
uh, you want to make sure that it continues to work. So in New York, there's actually a pretty good program. Here's, it's actually much better than signs I've seen in San Francisco. These signs tell you what to expect. Yes, this is a privately owned public space, but there it is. It's open to the public. No, no ifs, ands, or buts but. about that. It even tells you what number of trees it has, the number of chairs, the number of tables, and it gives you a way to complain if uh, for some reason that's not met. And here's another one very similar. Um, you find these public spaces in some very um, uh, surprising places. Um, uh, there's a string of them between 57th Street and, and 51st Street, mid, mid block between 6th and 7th Avenue. And it's called Sixth and a Half Avenue. Um, there's been talk um, about making that, renaming that Holly White Way. Um, I don't know what's happened to that. I looked into it there were, to the people who had initially suggested it. Um, uh, it. It's still a nice idea, and it can it can still be done. And I'll bet you we could find some people who would uh, underwrite the uh, the cost of some new street street signs. So the uh, the public has to be vigilant about its about the public realm. Um, institutions have to be vigilant because, as Holly says, um, when when you do these incentive um, variances, um, they're all very specific as to what the developer gets. Um, trouble is that they are often mushy as to what he is he is to give in return, and they're mushier yet um, as to what will happen if the developer doesn't deliver. So. Um, this is uh, something that Holly um, looked at. He took note of one um, of one building in particular. Just grabbed a building at random, um, I think, um, well known um, the, 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 um, in, in New York in the 1980s, and he put it into his book called City. Um, it was an 11-story building, a kind of a landmark building that's going to get knocked down and 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 replaced with a building that, with these incentive bonuses, would go up to 58 stories. Um, and the bonus uh, application required answers to, to a couple of uh, pertinent questions. Would the project change in scale or character in the surrounding space? Would it, ch would it change the demand for municipal services, such as police, fire, sewage, schools, you list the checklist these, these elements? And the developer's ar architect just checked off no, no change, no change on any of these. Um, so why? Uh, was rather surprised and he, and he looked into it and he said he could find no evidence that any independent investigation was ever made of these matters. Um, the City uh, Environmental Quality Review Board um, made its final determination and it just said, quote, the, the project would, quote, have no significant effect on the environment. And Holly says, no significant effect, no change in scale. Wow. Um, and so the building went up and, um, and here it is today. Um, and again, Holly uh, picked this building, um, the, story, the anecdote, mostly because of the building that it replaced. It was the old Bonwit, much beloved Bonwit Teller building. So it made a good story to tell back in 1988. Um, the significance of the owner was um, not that great. Um, so in, in, in Jacob's uh, 1992 book, uh, Systems of Survival, um, she begins to, to look at the institutional surroundings um, just as White did back in the early part of, of his career. Um, Jane was increasingly um, troubled uh, by what she saw. And in, and in Systems of Survival, um, one of the characters, I say characters because the book is, is presented in fictional form, um, warns that seeking harmony is a false lead. Uh, and he warns that procedures may actually help substitute for individual conscience. Um, not a good idea. Um, and, and think back to what, how White was worried about individuals sort of uh, exceeding moral authority to the, to the organization back in 1956. In 2004, this is Jane's fin um, final book, Dark Age Ahead. Um, she asserted that what should have been the stabilizing forces of culture had become ruined and, and irrelevant. Um, and I'll take just a minute to explain the, the anecdote because it comes back to East Harlem. Um, Jacobs um, took note of a killer heat wave that happened in Chicago back in 1995. Um, I think something like 900 people died. And, 
And a team of researchers from the CDC, about 80 people came up to Chicago to, to try to figure out what went wrong. And so they investigated everything and, they, and they, they concluded finally that the people who died were the ones who had failed to heed the authority's advice. The authority said, use air conditioning, drink plenty of water, go seek cool places. And, and the people who died were the ones who just didn't follow directions. Um, but Jane didn't really, Jane thought there was more to the story and she uncovered research by Eric Kleinenberg, who was then an unknown sociology grad student. And he was looking at the same problem and looking at the same data. And he discovered that residents of one neighborhood had a death rate about 10 times higher than the other. Um, the one that, that, that had the low death rate was, one of, was the kind of a neighborhood that, that Jane envisioned back in um, death and life of great American cities. Um, it was very similar to uh, East Harlem. Um, it has denser, it had retail stores, it had service businesses, it had residents who routinely went out and socialized with each other on the street. Um, they weren't afraid of, of strangers. Um, the other neighborhood people were afraid of strangers. They were there, there was no mixed use. There was it was just it was almost exclusively housing. People stayed to themselves. So for Jane, this should have been an I a perfect I told you so moment. And you would think that in, in 2004 she would say, well, here's a chance to to to, to reprise what I said in, in uh, Death and Life of Great American Cities. But she doesn't do that. Um, here's here's the uh, the East Harlem scene. Um, she took a different lesson from this whole thing. Um, and it's one that could, have been, that could have been cited by White in either one of his first, in his first book, The Organization Man. She asked this question, were any of these 80 CDC researchers potential Eric Kleinenbergs, so to speak? If so, why didn't they object to the inappropriate investigative strategy? Would they have been regarded as pariahs and troublemakers. So there she is, Jane at the end of her life, coming back to the theme raised by Holly in his 1950s work, um, particularly the organization man. Um, it was the peril of groupthink. It was the costly quest for harmony um, that might have derailed um, uh, the CDC people. So as Jane said in an interview late in her life, um, two years after Holly died in, in 1999, um, she said, Holly was an important person. In life. We were on the same wavelength. So we've already seen a few um, examples that, of that wavelength. I'll end with just um, two more brief examples. Uh, these are both with respect to their attitude toward the status quo. Um, in her book, Dark Asia, had Jane referred to the paralysis of certain scientific disciplines, such as uh, traffic engineering, which was um, seemed forever seeming, seemingly holding on to certain beliefs even long after they had been uh, uh, debunked, discredited. Um, and um, Jane said, there you are. Um, um, to, uh, you know, out, outmoded paradigms will stand staunchly until somebody within the field makes a leap of insight, imagination, uh, and courage sufficient to dislodge the absolute paradigm and replace it. Um, so that was Jane's take on, on, on this. Um, 51 years earlier, in a, in a um, uh, presentation White gave um, um, regarding the challenge of a bureaucratic society, and what, excuse me, what it needed to do to continue to vigorously pursue new thoughts and ideas. Um, Holly comes up with this. Every great advance has come about because someone was frustrated by the status quo. Someone exercised the skepticism, the questioning, and the kind of curiosity, which, to borrow a phrase, blows the lids off, blows the lid off everything. Um, the same wavelength, uh, the, 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 the echoes of Holly, um, of Jane at the end of her career with Holly at the beginning of, of his um, are amazing. And finally, um, the same wavelength and, and, and not to be too weary about it, um, but their final resting places. Um, Jane, she's the champion of, of, of the city, those strips of chaos that she observed in East Harlem, um, the, the uh, eyes on the street of Greenwich Village. Um, 
she ends up in a cemetery in the teeny town of SB, Pennsylvania. It's got a population of about 1,700 people. It's about 50 miles southwest of Scranton. It's in the middle of nowhere. Um, and then there's uh, Holly. He, when, when he was once asked to name his three favorite cities, it was easy, New York, New York, and New York. So where is Holly? Holly's in Oakland Cemetery, um, a, a very rural setting on the outskirts of, of, of West Chester. So um, they each found peace and quiet, uh, except as we know, it's, it's, um, it's not the kind of peace and quiet that, uh, uh, that people celebrated at Paley Park in which they much, much would have preferred. Um, but it's, uh, um, it's where they are, but not where we should leave them here tonight. And so I will end by concluding the, uh, uh, the video, um, the bookend to the video that, that Carol started, out, started us out with, which is the conclusion of, the, uh, of White's social life. Um, and it, uh, we can end, we can celebrate the diversity of the city that both Jane and uh, Holly uh, celebrated. And, and we will end literal, literally with an upbeat. I'll give this a uh, click and hope we can go. It was only after we had studied many other places that I realized we could have learned all of the lessons right here on 101st Street. It's an excellently scaled block, a comfortably sized space, very nicely enclosed, lots of people, and food, food. Very social activity too. Water, yes. And you can touch it, you can aim it, you can slosh around in it. Sitting, the best kind of space, slightly elevated. The lot at the corner is used for games, but the street itself is the number one area for recreation, including that very popular form, the polishing of the car. This block has its problems, but it works as a place here we are, back at Seagram. A group of music students are giving a little impromptu concert. Some executives are still conferring. It's a very nice time, just before 2 o'clock. Everybody's about ready to close up. So we end our film on plazas not on the plaza, but on the street itself. And that's where we should. The street is the river of life for the city. We come to these places not to escape from it, but to partake of it. Thank you, Richard. Um, hopefully, I'm going to see, there we go, um, see us both for a very brief dialogue because it is, after all, um, already uh, seven o'clock. And I, I want to uh, um, I want to compliment the book uh, as well as the framing of the evening for, for tonight. And I know because we had a pre-call of about an hour in order to make sure the video would play, but also to discuss the book uh, and, and some of the points that would be taken tonight. And it's clear to me that we have at least another hour of discussion um, where it would be wonderful to bring some additional people into the, um, into the discourse on, on White and Jacobs as well, um, as well as the broader context that we talked about a little bit uh, up, that we talked about a little bit earlier today and that I want to recommend to people another talk on our website in a video and of course this video will be archived so many more people can watch it at their at their convenience um, about a year ago Mariana Moglovich uh, gave a talk about her book which is the invention of public space that happened she argues uh, as a concept in, within the Lindsay administration, uh, which also embraced White and his research um, and the lessons of Jane Jacobs. So there is, there's a, a broad context of revolution as you alluded to in your, um, in, in your own youthful photographs and in the contrast of the, of the business suits, there was a revolution in thinking as, and a revolution of politics. 
um, that cut across cultures, uh, counterculture as, as well as the, the media cultures of, uh, of Fortune magazine, for example. So what you showed us in that last clip, um, which is you know, utterly appropriate, is that no one can tell a story about a city like Holly White could. <laughs> it's yeah. his, his yeah. voice, his, um, it, it, the, the clarity, the condensation of, and this is where I urge everybody to, to um, buy and read this book because what Richard makes so clear is number one, the logic of White's life, the way things make sense from his earliest years um, through the career moves that he made, through the pivots that he takes from landscape to, to city. And then as he did in this talk tonight, wrap it up. Um, the, the logic of the life is really undergirded by an incredible uh, work ethic of analysis, of empiricism, and of doing the work that's necessary in order to be able to draw those conclusions, which seem so obvious afterwards. Mm -hmm. And that kind of research, which supports his conclusions, which sounds so elf self-evident to us who love cities and, and hear that the street is the lifeblood and people like to sit in the sunshine and all these simple truths, we're not a part of the discussion in the urban planning circles of the time. This is, this is it was a whole new way of thinking. And Richard, as you pointed out to us tonight, Jane Jacobs may have gotten there first in terms of claiming um, in the uh, in first book that splashes onto the scene and then grows and grows in, in reputation. She, she may have been first onto the bestseller lists and into the, into the halls of fame, but the person who was there enabling and then in, um, it, you can hardly call him understated because he was always present and he was a best-selling author and he moved in the Rockefeller circles. So everything about the way he created a, a life uh, and a career, took advantage of the privilege of which he was able to partake. He had the advantages um, of being a male in that situation, but in a way his fame uh, has, has not grown in the same way, kind of exponential way as Jane Jacobs has. Yeah. But these two figures really are uh, in the second half of the 20th century, dominating the second half of the 20th century, America's two great urbanists. And Holly White really hasn't gotten the attention. He's never had a biography before. He hasn't had yeah. explainer like you are um, in order to show how, um, how he's a presence, even in places where you hear his voice or you think maybe he was an influence, but there he was working behind the scenes in order to shape the power relationships as well as the script um, that enters our consciousness. Yeah. He put a lot of her ideas into action, um, Carol, clearly. And, and, you know, he was effective at doing it because he was an organization man in the best sense. He was not afraid to rock the boat and, and he knew how to rock the boat without capsizing it, you know, a very, a very uh, pragmatic guy um, and, and also a, a, a nonpartisan guy. We're, of course, they were different days then, but went back and forth across the political aisle had no problem. I mean, he was, he, he wanted to get things done. Yeah. Uh, a special webinar discount uh, made available for 30% off uh, that you see in the screen. And I'm going to leave the screen on as I can continue to talk. This book has been already praised in the New York Times as a marvelous biography. It got a wonderful review in the Wall Street Journal. And as soon as I read the Times review, I, um, I leaped onto the internet in order to, to track down Richard in order to ask him to do a book talk for us. Um, and the book is only a couple of months old, but in particular tonight is one of the first of the talks that he's given. And it's really focused too on the relationship of Jane Jacobs uh, and, and Holly White. But in the context of this uh, career long, almost um, under the microscope uh, um, investigation that Richard has done uh, as himself a journalist in the kind of um, identification with Holly White's own career. Um, and, but this happens to be his, his first book. Richard is, um, 
after a reporting career that included stops at Time Magazine and at People Magazine, Richard Ryan launched a nationally acclaimed uh, weekly newspaper, US One, that played a role in, as a placemaker in the uh, fast growing Princeton Route One area. So an suburban or exurban part recognizing um, the last landscape uh, element of, of Holly White's work. Uh, he, uh, Richard now serves on, on uh, the board of Princeton Future, which is a not-for-profit that encourages sustainable urbanism, again, a kind of Holly White theme uh, in his hometown of Princeton. And he edits this hyper-local digital news site, which is called TAP Info. Princeton um, Community News. I want to make the connection and my personal connection to Jane Jacobs, who was, was um, one of the people uh, who very, very early on in my career as an architectural historian and urbanist converted me completely uh, to the study of cities in the kind of attention um, to detail and the life of the street that Jacobs began to articulate in this great, great book of the death and life of great American cities in 1961. And uh, among my friends who, uh, who are urbanists, so many of them said um, over the years that reading the Jane Jacobs book changed their lives. And I got to say that to Jane Jacobs herself when she was giving uh, a lecture at, at CUNY in the Lewis Mumford lecture series that was initiated with Jane Jacobs as the first speaker. And as you can see on the, this cover sheet of my very decrepit uh, um, copy of the paperback, 1980 copy of The Death and Life, um, that Jane Jacobs uh, um, signed it for me um, and, and dated it. And that was, it was a great thrill in order to meet her, someone who had really shaped such uh, an important approach to thinking about cities and, and indeed hit a chord that was so strong um, in, in my own life. Well, we, we are quite a bit after our time. And um, again, I just need to urge everybody to read this book in order to discover the things that you didn't know about Holly White uh, and, and how he was present at all these important points where decisions were being made that affect our lives um, still today. So uh, alas, the great, great film of the social life of small urban spaces is not widely available. And we certainly hope that you can find little clips of it on YouTube. And I urge everybody to see those parts that you can. Um, I, I believe you can pay in order to, uh, to see the whole film and, and universities are off, often showing it as I do to my students every year. Uh, but um, but it, it's really only Holly White who can do Holly White. But Richard, thank you tonight for um, bringing us um, so much of his life in, into into focus um, in a different way uh, when as when he was for the most part behind the camera and behind the scenes. So let me just mention yeah sorry um, let me just mention that in two weeks we have uh, on a completely different topic uh, but on one near and dear to the skyscraper museum's heart uh, we have Stefan Al uh, who will talk about his new book called Super Tall um, and in conversation with Paul Goldberger who reviewed it for the New York Times very recently in the book review section. So, uh, so please come back uh, and to our continuing series of monthly, monthly book talks, except we have two this particular month. So um, once again, Richard, thanks um, so much for sharing all of your, your research and your ideas and for connecting us um, to, uh, to Jane Jacobs uh, on her birthday as well as, as, as Holly's life. So uh, thanks so much. and. Um, Bye, everybody. We'll see you next time, I hope, in two weeks. Night. Thank you.